Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ole Jakob Sending. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, here to this event. Uh, I should remind everybody that the event is streamed. So uh, my colleague Morten Burrows and I decided just before Christmas that we wanted to have a seminar series on the issue of distrust and global disorder and developments in, in world politics. Uh, Morton had an event here on the Middle East in January. Today we were fortunate to have Dan Dresner from Tufts University. And then we will have a series of seminars uh, in May. We'll have an event on China uh, in June on Russia. Um, and later on in the fall on, on European politics. Now, uh, first of all, welcome so much, Dan. Uh, Dresner is professor at Tufts, uh, the author of many, many books, and also a regular contributor to the Washington Post. Um, and let me, before I kick up with the first question, we will start with a focus on American politics, then we will scale up a little bit to talk about the implications of political developments in the US for US foreign policy, and then turn to the issue of the effects of that on global governance and global order. Uh, if we could get the, uh, I have a graph that I want to show as a, to segue into the first question. So this is from Pew Research that demonstrates the, or shows the, uh, the level of trust in the US, in, in the US government. And, and what is interesting here is that one may argue that it tracks basically economic development. So steady economic growth in the 1990s uh, under Clinton, you see there is an increase in trust. Uh, we will deal with this graph perhaps a little bit later. Um, but then you see a steady decline from uh, Bush Jr. under Obama continues under Trump. Now this raises a question of the election of Donald Trump as a symptom rather than a cause. So is this a structural phenomenon? And what are the underlying factors that produces that structural phenomenon? Or is it perhaps cyclical? There have been debates in the US, as it has been in European countries, uh, that are quite similar to the ones that we are experiencing today, where there is a lack of trust, where there is populist mobilization. So the first question basically to you then is what do you see as the structural factors uh, and possibly also triggering factors in the political situation that we now have in, in the US? Um, so a few things before I answer that first question. First, thank you very much uh, to Ole Jakob for, for having me come. Uh, I would also like to thank the former Norwegian justice minister for uh, stepping down and thereby not having you all check your phones about whether or not there was going to be a government uh, by the end of this talk. The other thing, that, and I cannot stress this enough, this is possibly the most important thing you need to understand about the United States right now, which is that Occupied Season 2 just dropped on Netflix last week. So I haven't watched all of it, so no spoilers, please, if you haven't seen it. Um, now that said, back to the, the graph. Um, I, I think you can argue that on the one hand, it, it is cyclical. Um, but cyclical implies, you know, when we talk cycles, we often talk about in the form of years. And really, this is a kind of cycle where you're talking almost centuries, um, or at least many, many decades, which is, you know, if you read books like um, Richard Hofstetter's Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, a lot of people misinterpret that book and assume that what the book is arguing is that there's this long streak of, of anti-intellectualism in the United States. The United States has never embraced intellectuals or, or trusted elites. And that's not what Hofstetter is saying in that book. What Hofstetter is saying in that book 
is that there is a cycle, in fact, that there have been periods where, in fact, Americans put great trust um, in elites. Think uh, the progressive era, for example. Indeed, the progressive era was in many ways a reaction to the idea that American government had gotten too corrupt and that uh, plutocrats had too much power and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, there are, all, are, are also these counterwaves of, of rejection of elites. And I think that's what we've seen. And in that sense, I, com I completely agree that, that Donald Trump is much more a symptom rather than a cause of the, the erosion of trust um, uh, in institutions in the United States. Um, as to why that erosion of trust, I think there are, to be fair, valid reasons for that. Um, in some ways, you can argue that, that too much trust in elites is equally problematic. Um, it's not a coincidence that the, the sort of spike in trust starts or is at the peak is in the mid-60s. And then in the next decade after that, you have the wider escalation of the Vietnam War um, and then the Watergate scandal. Uh, so, you know, those twin scandals are not, uh, you know, nothing. And you would expect there to be a decline of trust um, in the best and the brightest, as it were, um, after shocks like that. Um, and then, you know, again, you do see it spike again after 9-11. And you can argue that was after a decade of relatively robust economic growth and a, a situation in which it seemed like both the system was working and there was a sort of rally around the flag effect um, post 9-11. And then we go to what happened after 9-11. And again, you cannot blame Americans for suddenly not trusting elites anymore. Because after 9-11, you then saw a war launched in Afghanistan that has not ended. You then saw another war in Iraq that had nothing to do with the war in Afghanistan and nonetheless has not ended. Um, and then the greatest economic crisis in a century. Um, you know, uh, at least in the first year, far worse than the, than the Great Depression. Uh, so again, it's not a shock that you see this kind of erosion of, of trust. And there are a few other factors kicking, which I think I, w I won't uh, spoil the preview because I think we're going to talk about that a little more later. But um, but yeah, there there are valid reasons um, for why Americans and and I guess the other thing I would say is that particularly in in foreign and economic policy, you can argue there has been a gap for decades between what elites think is the sort of best set of policies to pursue and what the public thinks. So if you, you know, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has done polling on elites and, and or ordinary sort of the mass public of Americans for quite some time. And for quite some time, ever since they started doing it in the 1970s, there is this gap between what elites feel with respect to attitudes about, let's say, globalization or... U.S. alliance commitments or what have you versus what ordinary Americans think. And the gap is, is that elites are far more enthusiastic and internationalist than ordinary Americans. Um, now, ironically, that gap is closing for a few interesting reasons. But if that gap persists for decades, you can't blame ordinary Americans for being somewhat skeptical about what their elites are thinking. One aspect of this Thank you. Is, is that is the issue of uh, economic inequality and relative deprivation. So if you consider, for example, the argument by uh, Clinton's uh, Labor Secretary Reich. Is Reich, it? Yeah, yeah. Robert Reich. So he's making the argument that from the 1970s, uh, the economic conditions of middle class Americans have steadily deteriorated, right? Well, the, the means by which they have been able to maintain the position yeah. have been more and more work, double work and then and debt. And debt on their house and all of that, right? So how does that factor in, you think, in in the big picture here? No, that factors in a, I think one of the other drivers is the widening of economic inequality in the United States. And that again in some ways is paired with the sort of great wave of globalization you can argue that begins in nineteen eighty. Um, because that's the moment at which, at least in the United States, middle class incomes um, start to stagnate. Um, now that didn't necessarily. That was you could you could see that in the data, but it wasn't necessarily immediately calamitous for a couple of reasons. First, Americans that owned their homes weren't necessarily worse off because even if their incomes weren't going up, their home you know the home equity prices were going up. So in some ways they were almost sitting on an ATM where they could continue to live a a you know a, a, an increasingly affluent lifestyle simply by borrowing against their house. Um, and indeed, that was one of the sources in the end of the, the 2008 financial crisis is that you had more and more people not just having mortgages but taking out home equity loans um, to try to finance uh, current consumption. Uh, 
Um, so that's so in some ways there there wasn't as much of a gap in consumption, but the way that gap was being financed was equally problematic. Um, so yeah, that's that's undeniably true. And then the other thing, and in some ways we're still seeing this play out right now, is that. The other thing that's happened that's shifted in the United States is almost cultural in terms of the way the economy has shifted. You know, you see this with debates about trade, and and we just had a special election in in the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania, and it was all about steel. And you know, the president, among other things, has said, if you don't have steel, you don't have a country. Um, the myth in the United States is that we don't have a steel industry, which we have a very large steel industry. We produce seventy percent of the steel we consume, but we don't have any more steel workers. Um, and the reason is, is because the steel industry has followed most of manufacturing and that it's become so productive that you don't need nearly as many workers as you used to. Um, so, there's, so there's been a shift, I think, in terms of, of workers in the United States leaving what used to be considered, you know, good union jobs, you know, on a factory in Detroit or in Pittsburgh. And now they're working at places like Home Depot um, or Costco. They're working on service sector jobs. They don't pay as well and are seen as not Digni as dignified. And, and so in that sense, it's almost a question of identity as much as it is of economics. Um, yeah, so a, a little pause here for this thing to go <laughs> off. Um, so I can start with my, my next question, which is basically a follow-up on, on the issue of trust. Because you, you wrote a book quite recently uh, on the IDs industry where the argument is that there is something has happened with trust, not in government per se, but in other important institutions, for example, uh, the idea of expertise and knowledge producing institutions, and what that has meant for the quality of public debate. Um, you can see some of the same dynamic in, in many European countries, um, including here in Norway. So it would be very interesting, I, I think, to hear the, the core argument, but also some examples of, of who the actors are and how that affects actually the framing of public debate uh, in the U.S. So in the, in the book, The Ideas Industry, I, I make the argument that there's sort of three core factors underlying why the marketplace of ideas has changed to where it is now. Um, the first, as you say, is, is the erosion of trust in not just the government. It's the erosion of trust in almost any authoritative institution in the United States. So both Pew and Gallup and the General Social Survey have all of these survey, surveys asking Americans not just their confidence in the government, but the confidence in business, in the media, in labor unions, in teachers, in any sort of major institution. And all of these data trends show the exact same thing, which is that with the exception of the United States military, trust in all of these institutions has trended downward um, significantly. Um, now, part of that is because, and this goes back to the, the previous answer, I would say, it's not just that the government has screwed up. I mean, you can understand why their trust in government would be lower um, because of policy screw-ups. There's also distrust in other authoritative elites because there's been a variety of scandals uh, that have been revealed, in which these institutions are not quite uh, as above board as we had thought. Um, as a book author, I hate to do this, but I need to cite another book, which is, um, I would highly recommend Chris Hayes' book, uh, Twilight of the Elites, um, which is an outstanding book that talks about how, if you look at the Catholic Church, or you look at universities, um, or you look at other institutions that you would ordinarily have thought were a beyond reproach, they're no longer beyond reproach. Um, and indeed, this is reflected in uh, trust in what we would consider institutions that would be considered knowledge-based, whether it's universities or hospitals or religious institutions. Uh, the General Social Survey, um, which is run at the University of Chicago, <coughs> asked Americans, you know, trust in these kinds of institutions. Back in 1972, 50% of Americans had a great deal of trust in these institutions. And by 2012, it was down to 30%. Um, again, in no small part because there have been controversies involving things like vaccines, not, uh, you know, like the swine flu one back in the 70s, um, or again, religious institutions in terms of the Catholic Church, or universities in terms of, you know, corruption in athletics programs, or um, research scandals that have, uh, you know, pl or plagiarism scandals that have affected um, the academy, or even, you know, so again, I want to be clear on this. I, I 
I don't think the erosion of trust is a healthy thing, but I do think it's an understandable thing. And I, I um, you know, so in the sense that, that when you see, you know, people's doubting social science, well, if you're a social scientist, there's some valid reasons to doubt aspects of social science research, at least in terms of things like replicability. So, you know, we're having these debates within our field. It's not surprising that, that that's spreading uh, to wider, uh, wider parts of the, the country. The second trend, and this is one where I don't know how much it generalizes beyond the United States because of different political systems, but it does play a large role, I think, in the United States, is the dramatic increase in political polarization um, in the United States. And, and this comes through if you take a look at things like congressional voting patterns or you know general surveys that Pew have, and others have done in terms of, of party activists and what have you. Essentially, all of the data show the same thing, which is since 1970, Democrats have moved further to the left and Republicans have moved way, way, way further to the right. Um, and this is particularly concentrated among people who are politically active. So in other words, the more likely you're a party activist, the more likely you are at the extreme of either party. Um, now, there are a couple of arguments within the United States about why this is taking place. One could be that people are actually getting more ideologically extreme. There's another argument that basically explains this on something called partisan sorting, which is to say that essentially, f for a, ver a variety of historical quirks, you had Democrats in the South um, were much more conservative than, let's say, Republicans in the Northeast uh, for a long time. But after the civil rights era in the 1960s, those Democrats realized they were actually Republicans and so basically switched parties. And similarly, you had what were called Rockefeller Republicans in the Northeast, um, sort of the George H.W. Bush types, realizing, oh, wait, I'm actually way to the left of my rel you know, party. And so it's not that these people became more ideologically extreme. They just joined the party they probably should have been part of for a, a longer period of time. Um, and that matters because it means that if it's partisan sorting, it might be that Americans haven't become that much more radical. It's just be that the parties have become more ideologically pure. But the real problem is that even if it's due to partisan sorting, essentially you're seeing this creation and inculcation of in-group identities, which means that in essence, disliking someone for their political ideology is the last legal form of discrimination in the United States, um, which is to say that if you take a look at survey work, um, Americans are more likely to discriminate based on hiring, you know, hiring people based on someone's political affiliation than on their race or gender or religious orientation or sexual orientation. Um, and indeed, if you poll party elites, you know, and you ask them what is their opinion of members of the other party, you know, you would see increases in the number of people who think that the other party is no longer as intelligent, you know, or trustworthy, or they don't want their children to marry outside of their political persuasion. Um, and so these are all, you know, these are incredibly problematic because essentially now you have a situation where, um, and there's been great work on this done by Elizabeth Saunders and Alexander Gussinger, that shows that if an issue is politically polarized, in other words, if an issue becomes sort of one that, that's defined by partisanship, expert consensus has no effect. So in other words, if you take a look at, you know, if you ask Americans, what's your opinion on climate change? Climate change is an issue that has clearly become politically polarized, which is to say Democrats really think it's a real problem. Republicans insist either it's not a real problem or we doubt the science or what have you. If you then present people with, well, we have an expert consensus that says this is what's going on, it doesn't move anyone's opinion. If you do introduce them to an issue where, let's say there hasn't been a partisan division, let's say, I don't know, um, uh, one of the pro well, no, I, I, I'm having a hard time coming up with one. Uh, let's say, let's say policy in the Arctic, for example. Actually, that that'll you know, um, where you know most Americans simply don't know. And if you then present them with an expert consensus, that will shift opinion. Um, so, but the problem is, is that we we're in a situation where we have the polarization of everything. Essentially, every issue, even cultural you know issues, have now become so politically polarized. Um, that it becomes impossible to sort of believe in neutral expertise. Um, everyone clearly must have an agenda or something. And so that makes it harder to have a, a productive debate. Um, and then the third trend that I talk about is, and is linked to is this rise of, of economic inequality um, and wealth inequality. Um, there are obvious socioeconomic issues with that, but the reason it affects the marketplace of ideas is that we now see 
this sort of new plutocratic class um, that essentially have billions of dollars. And it turns out that if you have that much money and you have everything you could possibly want to buy in the world, then what you wind up doing is going back to college. Um, except you don't go back to college. What you do is create your own intellectual salon. Um, and you bring in thought leaders or, you know, provocative thinkers to, you know, and I put provocative in quotes, you know, to sort of uh, tell you stuff. Except that if you think that if speaking truth to power is really hard, try speaking truth to money. Um, that's even harder. Uh, because essentially, if you're a billionaire, you wind up becoming, and, and this applies to the president as well, if you're a billionaire or billionaire, um, you genuinely will tend to believe that you've gotten to where you are in life entirely based on your own self-worth and self-value. And therefore, you are not going to want to hear from people who tell you that the reason you got to where you are is that you were born on third base, um, which is an Americanism, which is to say that you were born into privilege anyway. Um, that it doesn't matter that, that yes, you might have you know, done a few things, but really there, there are sort of these structural inequalities. And so as a result, they wind up funding and or, or taking much more interest in thought leaders who will tell them what they already want to believe, you know, here anyway, or tell them what they already believe, which is to say disruption is good and, you know, founders are good and you want to constantly shake up the system and, and other buzzwords that do not come to mind right now. <laughs> On that, I mean, there are plenty of, of uh, very wealthy individuals and groups in the United States that seems to be advancing a progressive type of agenda. So I'm just wondering about whether there are environments where, so in Europe you have, uh, you know, George Soros who invested, you know, Central European University and all that, an open uh, society foundation. Uh, but how does that look in the United States, given all the tech billionaires, for example, in, in California? Um, so, if you take a look at the survey, there, there's not a lot of great survey work of billionaires. It's really hard to get them to, to answer questions. Um, but that said, there is some research that's been done on this. And I think the way to put it is the following. There is a fair amount of heterogeneity among the sort of plutocratic class when it comes to views about, let's say, social policy. Um, so about gay marriage, for example, or you know, other sort of uh, cultural issues. However, when you start asking them about economics or economic policy, there is much greater degree of homogeneity among the plutocratic class. Now, you will, you will have the occasional Tom Steyer or George Soros um, who spends a fair amount of money because of environmental causes or you know, believing in, in promoting civil society. But even the Silicon Valley types um, are very libertarian when it comes to attitudes about economic policy. They are extremely suspicious of the role of the state um, in terms of providing public goods. Indeed, Silicon Valley is, is extremely problematic because Silicon Valley tends to look at the state not as, ironically, the, the very source of the internet that they have exploited, um, because it was originally a, a invention by the Defense Department to, to deal with communications in the wake of nuclear war. They see it as a faulty piece of code that needs to be bypassed. Um, so indeed, to be fair, Silicon Valley, you know, plutocrats genuinely believe in civic activism. I don't mean to, 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 um, to caricature them, but they also don't believe necessarily that the state will, they, they see the state as, as an outmoded 19th century institution that can't help them. Um, now to be fair, some, I think, some of these people are actually beginning to move down the learning curve and realizing, oh, I guess the algorithm that we thought that would solve this sort of problem is not actually going to do it. Maybe we need to, to rethink these things. But again, there's a fair amount of arrogance going on in, in Palo Alto when it comes to these sorts of issues. And so it's going to take a long time for that learning curve to kick in. Let's uh, shift gear a little bit to Donald Trump as president. And so we talked a little bit about economic policy, etc. Um, now, security and foreign policy. Um, certainly, there is a fair amount of, of uh, debates uh, about uh, President Trump's Twitter feeds and, and all of that. Uh, but then you see underneath that perhaps more stability than, than people tend to think in, in foreign policy. So 
but still, I mean, it the, it's a mixed picture, right? So on, so there is now, uh, so there was a lot of debate, of course, about the uncertainty created with regards to Article Five in NATO, um, an apparent withdrawal from key international organizations now with the tariffs on on steel and aluminum. Uh, but then again, maybe maybe some um, some progress can be made on North Korea. Uh, it remains to be seen. But what's what's your reading of the changes relative to actual stability on Trump's foreign policy? So I, I think when it comes to foreign policy, you need to actually there's a nice neat divide between the security sphere and sort of everything else. On the security sphere, I tend to agree with you, which is to say that while Donald Trump. Donald Trump has not helped matters by, let's say, in his first big speech to NATO, not reaffirming Article 5. He did eventually reaffirm Article 5. Um, and, I, you know, I had the good fortune of attending the Munich Security Conference um, a couple of, of weeks ago. And what was striking to me about the conference was the degree to which the American participants – there were two things that were interesting to me. The first is – the American participation was a little more marginal than it apparently normally was. So the Secretary of Defense did not give a speech, which is unusual. Um, but that said, when they did speak, you know, H.R. McMaster spoke. Um, I saw Kurt Volker on the, uh, you know, on a side panel, who's the, uh, the U.S. Uh, special envoy for Ukraine. Um, there were, you know, members of Congress. Really, you could have taken 5% of what they said and deleted it, and it would have looked like the exact same thing that the Obama administration would have said in 2016, which is to say that I think on security issues, there hasn't been nearly as much of a, uh, um, it actually has been largely status quo if you ignore the rhetoric, which is kind of a big if. I mean, that's that's not nothing. Um, on the the economic side of you know foreign economic policy or attitude towards multilateralism or what have you, um, no, I actually do really think this is a big change. Um, and part of it is that, and we've even seen this in the last couple of weeks, which is to say that, you know, last year there was this, you know, argument that, that there was an axis of adults um, in the Trump administration, that, that while Trump himself might be uh, sort of a, a, an unguided missile when it comes to, to policy, that there were grown-ups in the room, whether it was Jim Mattis, who was the Secretary of Defense, or Rex Tillerson, who was the Secretary of State, um, or John Kelly, who became uh, the chief of staff, or Gary Cohn, or what have you, and that they would prevent Trump from acting out on his worst impulses. Um, I have some bad news for you all. That's gone. Um, I don't know really how powerful it ever was, but the scary, th the thing that should scare you is that Donald Trump now actually thinks that he's got the hang of this job. Um, he's been at it for a year, and so he really, in his own mind, he thinks that he can that that he actually knows better than 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 his advisors um and to be fair i'm not going to defend rex tillerson as a secretary of state i really do think he was the worst secretary of state in 150 years at least um he was not a good secretary of state i did i was somewhat more sympathetic to his impulse to his foreign policy impulses than i were than i was to trump but trump wasn't wrong in, in necessarily wanting to fire him i think the way trump thinks about this is twofold. First, he has he does fundamentally reject the sort of liberal internationalism that animated post-war presidents since Harry Truman, which is Donald Trump legitimately thinks that the liberal international order is screwed over the United States, um, and the United States has gotten a raw deal from this, and that elites on bo and, and both sides have have embraced it, and that that needs to be changed. Um, and the other thing that he thinks is that he's been told repeatedly as president, you can't do this impose steel tariffs, or you can't do that, you know, announce a summit with Kim Jong-un, because that will lead to really bad outcomes. And the bad outcomes haven't happened yet. Um, I don't mean to say that the steel tariffs are a great idea. They're not. They're a horrible idea. They're going to cost more jobs than, than, than they're going to create. But in some ways, part of what forced Trump to hold off on this was that you had people like Gary Cohn and Steve Mnuchin telling him that if he imposed steel tariffs, the stock market would freak out. Um, and that would wipe out, you know, which he's obsessed with. Um, and sure enough, you know, when he announced the steel tariffs and when Gary Cohn stepped down, the stock market fell for a little bit, but it's now fully recovered, you know, all of its losses. And to someone like Trump, the message he gets from that is, no, I can actually do all this and there won't be any serious ramifications. So I think on security, he will still, he still defers to Jim, to, to Secretary of Defense Mattis. He still defers to generals to some extent. 
on the security straight. You saw that with the Afghanistan uh, uh, policy as well. That is still an area where I don't think he has any confidence. But on other stuff, on the foreign economic policy, no, I think he thinks he knows best. Um, and so I think you're going to continue to see, you know, next month there's going to be more tariffs placed on China. Um, we'll see how the NAFTA debate plays out. Uh, every time Trump does something and there isn't an immediate and negative response, he feels emboldened to do more stuff. And so I think that's the way you need to think about it on that front. I mean, this brings up another issue, which is if you think about U.S. Um, hegemonic position uh, with the last uh, decades, it has, I think it could be argued, uh, rested on the premise that the U.S. bears a large share of the costs of certain you know, goods. Uh, and that what you see with Trump is this focus on so the privileging of economics and the idea of costs and the U.S. being, you know, getting a, a bad deal is now also affecting security cooperation. So that, that is what was underneath the NATO uncertainty, et cetera, right? So it's all about focusing on what does this cost the U.S. and not seeing the broader picture, which is, well, if you want that position, you have to bear the cost. That is the basis on which your leading position rests. So that brings up the issue, right, of, of how that can undermine the position over time, but also how this, this is now happening at the same time as you see a new type of tactics from or strategy from Russia, and also, of course, from China beefing up it, its investments within international organizations and also building alternatives to it. Yeah. Uh, so a few things on this. The, the first is, is that in some ways what Donald Trump is doing, Donald Trump really is like, a, a, you know, we talk in, in, in public opinion about the idea of rational ignorance of, of voters, which is not meant as an epithet. It means that Voters, at least in the United States, are very uninformed about questions about foreign affairs, and it is also incredibly rational for them to be uninformed because for most Americans, most foreign policy does not affect them at all. These are busy people. They, they have jobs. They have mortgages. Um, they've got season two of Occupied to catch up on. So, you know, they're not going to pay attention to, uh, to these other, you know, these more arcane questions about foreign policy, which means that they're incredibly uninformed about this. If you poll Americans, and this is always the standard way of representing this, and you ask Americans, what percentage of the federal government's budget do you think is devoted to foreign aid? The median answer you will get from Americans is about 20% of Americans' budget, um, when in fact it is 0.5%. Um, so it's one of these things where, you know, inevitably in presidential campaigns, pres you know, candidates will talk about, well, the way we're going to balance the budget is by cutting foreign aid, which is an absurd way of thinking about it, except if enough Americans believe that, that we spend a lot on foreign aid, they'll buy this, to, they'll believe this to be true. In some ways, Donald Trump has exploited that and also might actually believe it himself. But he seems to think that somehow, you know, if we, if you rebalance NATO contributions um, and or that, that countries start paying more for U.S., for the right to base U.S. soldiers, which is a truly odd concept, that somehow that will improve America's finances. And, and even a quick glance at the numbers shows that, that that's not going to be the case. But the other thing, and I agree with you on this, is that what, what Donald Trump doesn't realize um, is that a lot of what has sustained what we would consider American leadership or American hegemony is, the no, is two things. The first is, is that America has borne a disproportionate share of the burden in terms of military spending to some extent. And to be fair, that also served American interests. One of the best benefits of U.S. hegemony for a long time was not just that the United States you know, had a large military, but because of our alliance system, it meant that countries like Japan or Germany did not have large militaries. Um, and that was generally thought to be a good thing from the perspective of the United States. Uh, and also a good thing for because it meant that South Korea was less worried about Japan or France was less worried about Germany or what have you. Um, Trump doesn't realize that at all. Um, the second thing... And again, this is going to sound corny, but, but one of the reasons that I think U.S. leadership worked was not just because the liberal international order served U.S. interests. It was that also the U.S. could evince a higher set of ideals that the liberal international order was supposed to appeal to, that there was a higher social purpose. 
that it wasn't just good for American interests, it was good for American values. The values being promotion of democracy, promotion of free markets, promotion of human rights, and so forth. And Donald Trump doesn't believe in any of that. Um, he has, if there is one thing, this, and this is where the rhetoric does matter, if there has been one thing that this administration has been catastrophically bad at, it's articulating that kind of higher set of principles. Um, and so if the United States just winds up looking like a different kind of China, um, you know, which is to say not, you know, we're in it for, for the buck, well, then that's going to cause allies to start, you know, looking around and, or casting about for alternatives, or at least not, you know, looking at the relationship. If Donald Trump looks at foreign relations as a transactional arrangement, then allies are going to start looking back in the same kind of transactional way. Um, and that doesn't necessarily bode well for U.S. foreign policy. The larger issue here, I guess, is is whether the liberal international order um, uh, will will be maintained, reestablished. Uh, can we put the genie back in the bottle, or is is what we will see in the coming decade or so be something significantly different from what we have been used to living with in terms of? multilateralism, a rules-based order, and all these uh, higher ideals to which many countries were, were striving? Um, I think there, there are sort of two known unknowns out there that will, that will answer that. Well, I guess maybe three known unknowns that will answer that question. The first is, what does China think about the current order? Um, and to be fair, it's been, it's very ambivalent. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's you know the the current rage now is to talk about how China is developing those alternative institutions and through things like the Belt and Road Initiative or buying Greece's largest port or what have you. It's it's you know exercising this malevolent influence. Um, I, I'm not going to you know obviously you know if you look at China's internal politics, they're cl they're clearly going from semi-authoritarian to really really authoritarian. But to be fair, China, you know, and I argue this in, in my book, This Isn't Work, China did play a, uh, was a responsible stakeholder in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. China, at least on the economic side, does buy into these kinds of, of um, you know, principles of, of the benefits of globalization. I mean, it's globalization with Chinese characteristics, but there, there is a fair amount of overlap between that and what the, the West is generally promulgated. The question is whether China feels emboldened to rewrite the rules of the game even more in favor of China. Um, and I, to be fair, I'm not, I, I think that's still unclear. Um, you might think with time they'll, they'll grow more confident, but I, I think that masks the degree to which China's internal economy is going to be facing some significant challenges in the next couple of years. And the question is, how does it navigate those challenges? The second known, un known unknown is what happens in American politics. So, you know, we've been talking about all these sort of trends about erosion of trust and so on and so forth, and, and Trump is president and, and will be probably until 2020. Um, what this masks is the degree to which Trump himself has wound up generating vigorous antibodies to Trump. Um, and I think this might, I, I don't know how much outside the United States this is quite appreciated, which is, you know, in all likelihood, Democrats are going to do extremely well in the midterm elections that are coming in, in the fall. Um, you've already seen them, you know, a Democrat won a Senate seat in Alabama. Um, you know, for non-Americans, this doesn't happen anymore. That's not a normal thing. Um, there was just a special election in Pennsylvania where a Democrat won a seat that Trump won by 20 percentage points um, 15 months ago. This all suggests that while Republicans at this point control all three branches of government, um, it is not clear if that will be the case going forward. Um, so it's possible the Democrats might take back the House in 2018. I would put better than 50-50 chances of that at this point, um, which is not to say it's a slam dunk, but it might happen. And then the real big question is, is Donald Trump a one-term president or not? Um, so first, if the Democrats wind up controlling at least one branch of Congress, suddenly Trump will face far greater constraints in terms of implementing some things that he, that he might have thought he was going to be able to do before. And he's also going to be facing the subpoena power of Congress in a way that he wouldn't have, he hasn't had to deal with, he has had to deal with, but not nearly as much as he would have if, if Democrats were in control. And then it's whether Donald Trump gets reelected. You know, Donald Trump getting elected once is a fluke. Um, him getting elected twice is another question altogether. And, you know, the problem is, is that Americans have been in the habit of electing, uh, reelecting the incumbent uh, for the last three go-rounds. So, 
Um, it is entirely possible that Trump could win in 2020, particularly if, by the way, you have a Democratic Congress that winds up acting in an an antagonistic way. But what is striking to me, I guess, is the degree to which you have a U.S. By any sort of conventional metric in terms of, of the U.S. economy, the U.S. economy is doing pretty well right now. You know, we have pretty low unemployment. We've got pretty decent and uninterrupted economic growth for the last almost 10 years now. Um, inflation doesn't look to be that big of a, a problem. You know, the economy seems to have be occupying the sweet spot right now, and yet Donald Trump has an approval rating of only 40%. That shouldn't be happening. He should be at 60% with that kind of economy. And so it suggests that Trump himself is genuinely toxic enough so that um, you might see this sort of political blow back to him. And if you have Democrats elected, they're, you know, part of what's going on is they do embrace the liberal international order a little more than and, than, uh, than Trump does. And indeed, what's weird is that if you take a look at polling attitudes, uh, asking Americans about attitudes like free trade or immigration or alliances, Americans have suddenly become, Donald Trump has made liberal internationalism great again, um, which is to say that, that he's made Americans more enthusiastic about these ideas than they were three or four years ago. Um, and it might be that weirdly, what Trump is doing is showing what happens when the counterfactual um, actually gets implemented. You know, it's easy to criticize the liberal international order, you know, by saying, well, there are these problems. And there are these problems. I don't mean to say it's a, it's a perfect system. But what Trump has done is demonstrated, okay, this is what happens if you deviate from that. Um, and it looks bad. America's soft power has been eviscerated. Um, you know, there's a whole host of other, pro you know, sort of ugly aspects. And so it's possible that Americans realized, oh, this was not, we, we prefer the way things used to be actually crap. So we'll see how that goes. A couple of more questions and then we'll open up for, for questions and comments from, from the audience. Now, I want to return to this issue of, of, of trust again. Um, you made a very good point, I think, which is that uh, people have good reason not necessarily to trust their government and, and particular institutions and so on. Now, that brings up the question of, of what groups the liberal international order has served the most, right? Uh, and the other question of of the zone for cooperation and the prospect of more international cooperation as things look today. So in the US, but also in many European countries, the zone for international cooperation seems to be shrinking in the sense that state leaders' hands are much more tied there isn't all that great appetite for more uh, ambitious international cooperation. So states don't make treaties that much anymore, for example. Nothing is happening on the WTO. Uh, there is deadlock in, in the Security Council at the UN, etc., etc. Now, the flip side of that, if you like, is that there are a lot of important challenges in many countries that are not necessarily solved by more international cooperation. So many of us that study international politics and in the context of global globalization tend to think, well, the solution to this is more international cooperation, right? But if you take issues like, uh, well, welfare, uh, distribution issues, etc., that is something best addressed at the national level. So there seems to be uh, an interesting paradox, if you like, that uh, the the idea of more international cooperation seems to be now at some inflection point. Um, so what, what's your thought on, on that? So I would say a few things on this. The, the first is if you're asking who, you know, qui bono, who benefits from, from the liberal international order, the, the glib answer is workers in the developing world and owners of capital in the developed world. You know, I mean, this is sort of a classic Stoppel Samuelson theorem, which says, that, and, and I would stress that's not nothing. You know, you've had the greatest degree of poverty reduction in the world over the last 20 to 30 years, and that's nothing to scoff at. But to be fair, voters in Europe and the United States also might respond with, yes, but how does that benefit us? And I think that's the, the valid question to ask, because the beneficiaries in, you know, in the developed world are those people who already, you know, were at the top of the income spectrum, those who could exploit uh, the sort of global opportunities. And so that has led to the kind of widening inequalities uh, 
uh, that we've seen. And so that's where I do think part of the problem is, is that even if the cause of some of these issues is international, as you say, one of the, one of the problems is that traditionally the solution has been domestic. Um, and so there's a genuine question of to what extent do you need to bolster social safety nets um, to do this? Except even here, in some ways, even answering it that way gives the impression that the solution is economic. And I think the problem is, is that we are now in a period where the political problems are not just about the economy. In fact, the economy isn't even the main culprit. It's a background condition. And I think that's part of it. This is about identity. And that's much more problematic. Um, you know, it's about identity in the form of the refugee crisis in the European Union, and in the United States, it's in the form of a wave of immigration that went happened from 1986 to about 2006. And so, you know, if you if you take a look at things like the Brexit referendum or the 2016 election in the United States, you know, most polling and and sort of political science analysis that looks at this and says, well, were there political science, you know, economic factors or cultural factors that explain why people vote? It's all culture. I mean, economics plays a, a supporting role in this, and I don't mean to, to belittle it, but it is primarily the people who voted for Trump are people who feel like the United States is not the way that it was when they were growing up, and they don't like that. And indeed, what's particularly interesting is, you know, hostility and immigration, for example, in the United States, it's rooted almost primarily in areas that don't have any immigration or, or just beginning to experience it. Whereas if you're living in Florida or Texas or California, it's a it's been a multicultural society for you know gen, for for generations. There's much far less agita there on these questions. So one of the interesting questions is whether this is literally a sort of phase transition where once people get used to this, and to be blunt, the people who don't like it die. Um, do you see this kind of shift in in attitudes that winds up not generating these kinds of things, or is this going to be a continued disruption? Um, I went off on a rant there, and I can't remember if I answered the second part of your question. No, but that, that's fine. Just one final one. I mean, what you what you what you say now, combined with the argument from your book, the ideas industry and um, and the marketplace of uh, for ideas, would suggest that it's going to be difficult to get back or out of this cycle. No. So yeah. Um, <laughs> The, here's the, the, the good news part of the story, which is we've been in this situation, at least in the United States, we've been in this situation before. You know, the last time we had a period where there was this degree of distrust in institutions, this high degree of political polarization, and this amount of economic inequality was the end of the 19th century. Um, and the good news is, is that there was then a progressive era, and, you know, you wound up, the cycle turned, you know, and, and eventually you wound up with a, a situation where elites played a larger role. That's the good side of the story. Uh, the bad side of the story is that while the progressive era played a role in that, so did two world wars and a Great Depression. Um, that you had really serious shocks to the system that caused people to realize, oh, okay, we've, we've got to change the way we do things. And what does terrify me is the notion that we need to have that kind of, that degree of shock for the situation to change. And I honestly don't, you know, that's a very, uh, uh, gloomy way of, of ending, but it, it's nonetheless the reality, I think. Okay, on that note, no, okay. let's, uh, let's get some questions and comments from the audience, and I'll ask you please to identify yourselves and, and be brief so that we can have many questions, starting in the front here. Thank you. Yulia Willemsen, I'm a senior research fellow here. I had one, uh, two quick questions. First one, you said that the, there's a lack of trust to all leadership apart from the military and the generals. Could you explain why there is trust in them? Then secondly, I'm interested in <coughs> the relation to the liberal uh, international order and the return of people who believe in that. And I would like you to elaborate a bit because there are different versions of how to support this uh, liberal uh, international order. And um, I'm, I'm a Russia studies person, and I would say that, you know, the, the version of uh, spreading the liberal international order through military intervention uh, is in a way a new, uh, a new version of it. 
which has been escalating in the past 15 years and it creates a lot of problems. For Russia, for example, the uh, liberal international order wasn't so problematic before this trend started. So is there another camp who would uh, um, promote a liberal, uh, liberal international order through more peaceful means? Is there any thinking on that in this alternative camp? Thank you. So to answer your first question on the military, uh, part of it, I think, is that um, there were a few reasons for this. The first is just the first is simply we've been at war now for 15 years um, and there are ways in which, you know, there's just a general respect for the troops that I think there there wasn't necessarily in the post. In some ways, it was a reaction to the post Vietnam period and the fact that the military then responded to that by essentially, uh, uh, you know, by ending the draft and becoming an all-volunteer military, it changed the relationship between, I think, American society and the military. It was no longer seen as you might get conscripted to serve, but rather that you had volunteered, and therefore that was a, a form of service. Um, and related to that, I think part of the reason the military still has high levels of trust, despite the fact that there have actually been a fair number of scandals within the military as well, um, is that the military represents ideals that both liberals and conservatives can like. So in terms of conservatives, conservatives like the military for all the standard reasons you would expect conservatives to like the military. It represents, you know, belief in, in you know, patriotism and national service um, in a hierarchical, you know, command structure, um, all of these kinds of things. But the military in the United States has also been, in some ways, a trailblazer for a variety of social, you know, for forms of social change um, that means that liberals like it too. So, I mean, when... When the military desegregated, that was that was ahead of rather than behind the civil rights movement in the United States. The uh, treatment of gay marriage um, and and uh, gays serving in the military, it was remarkable how seamless that was in some ways. Um, it, you know, in the in the late two thousands and early part of this decade, um, and so in some ways the 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 military represents an aspect of society that. Um, which is disturbing in some ways, but but in some ways the military represents a way in which society functions that I think a lot of Americans would wish that the rest of the country operated along. Now the problem, of course, is that that then leads to some some disturbing implications, which is do you really want uh, the rest of the country to to function like the military? But that said, there are admiral, you know, there are there are extremely admirable ways in which the military has handled a variety of sort of social changes in the country, which you can argue the rest of the country has had more difficulty dealing with. Um, on the liberal international order, so it's funny, when I think liberal international order, I don't necessarily think about the security side of, of things as much. Partly it's because I do, glo you know, I'm, my original training is in global political economy. So when I think liberal international order, I think the economic rules of the game or the environmental rules of the game or, you know, to some extent, the sort of ideals about human rights and democracy that, that are being promoted. But you're right, eventually there's a security sphere of it. Um, do I think that the liberal international order can be divorced from that completely? No. But is it possible to talk about defending the liberal international order um, in a way that, that focuses primarily on non-military means as opposed to military means? Yeah, I think absolutely. And in some ways, this goes back to a, the thing I'd forgotten to, to talk to you about. When we talk about the liberal inter international order and the sort of institutions that make it up, I think there's a danger in confusing stock with flow, by which I mean that the stock of international institutions that we have now is far thicker than it was even 20 years ago, um, and certainly 40 years ago or during the Cold War. Um, the problem is, is that the flow has stopped. Um, what, what you haven't seen is the creation of really sort of vigorous new multilateral institutions. Instead, they're much more informal, things like the G20, um, or the P5 plus one, or so on and so forth. And it's interesting to ask whether that's a, uh, whether that's a problem or, or a solution. And I, I think the jury is still out on that. It might be that it's, it's concerning because we don't have these sort of hard treaty organizations that, you know, that, that demonstrate a degree of durability that presumably a, a contact group like the P5 plus one doesn't. On the other hand, the reason you're seeing a shift to those groups is because they're less rigid. They're a little more flexible. Um, I, I think you ideally, in terms of global governance, want a mix of those kinds of, you know, hard law institutions, but you also want the kind of soft law ones. And in some ways, much as in the United States, what we're concerned about is not the erosion of the rule of law, but rather the erosion of norms that we previously didn't realize we had taken for granted. 
um, that now are suddenly becoming much more important because we have an administration that doesn't necessarily adhere to them. I think that's also true at the international level, that the problem isn't, you know, just the WTO is collapsing or anything like that. It's that some of the norms or more informal regimes that we took for granted no longer seem to be operable. And so in some ways is the question is how do we cope with that? Um, Hilda Rastad, Bjorknes uh, University College. Thank you for being here, Professor Dresner. This is really fun and depressing at the same time. Um, I'm glad you, you um, addressed identity at the end because I think um, what political science is finding about the, what, what Trump was the symptom of was much more identity um, than economics. And um, I have two questions. One is about, you mentioned the effect of immigration in the U.S., uh, which is related to the demographic change in the U.S., right? So in many ways, can you reduce what Trump is a symptom of to the reaction to the fact that in 2045 the U.S. will be a minority majority society where white people will no longer be? Because um, when you're talking about identity, what you're talking about is also status. And this feeling that white males, let's say, are no longer the master race, let's say, of the U.S. These I don't like using these words. Let's not say that. Let's, but, but I, under, <laughs> I understand words, what you're trying to say. Yeah, yes, no, yes. it's um, Trump brings out the worst in all of us. So that makes me a li yeah. really uncomfortable. Yeah. But, keep, but well, keep going. Yeah, exactly. It, it makes everyone uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and the second question is about um, the partisan makeup of distrust. Because you guys are talking about the gen the general levels of distrust in, in American society, but I would argue that one party has been more um, active in telling its voters to not trust elites. Um, e even as president, Ronald Reagan, you know, said that the the problem is the government; it's not the solution. And the scariest words in the English language is "I'm the government; I'm here to help you." Um, and since then, it's sort of been downhill in terms of the Republican Party telling its voters not to trust elites or the government. So I'm also wondering about the, the partisan makeup. May I suggest that we, we group them a little bit sure. um, so that we have time for, uh, for everybody uh, there? And then... I'll just make this, uh, yeah, my name is Jon Farset. I have a, just a short question. Uh, when you show, uh, the chart you showed with the... Uh, ups and downs of trusts in government or in elites. It seemed to me that they tend to be on a low when it's Democrats in the power in the White House. Is this a correct observation or and what is the reason behind it if so? Or is it just coincidence? Okay, I'll answer that question, uh, question first. Uh, no, I don't think that's correct. Um, which is to say, if you take a look at the chart, uh, you actually saw rising levels of trust when Clinton was president. When Obama was president, you saw low levels of trust. But to be fair, I don't think that it, that it, that had something to do with Obama and a hell of a lot to do with the 2008 um, financial crisis. So I don't think it's linked to – that's not linked to party. What you generally see happen is that when – what it might be is that um, – when a Democrat takes, you know, uh, power of the presidency, it's remarkable how suddenly Democrats have much greater faith in the government and Republicans suddenly have much greater distrust of the government. Um, or and, and then there are occasional moments where, you know, like, for example, there was a lot of talk about how in 2017 Americans had never felt better about the economy. Well, that was truly a partisan effect because basically Democrats had been pretty – had been feeling pretty good about the economy for a while because it had been doing reasonably well under the Obama period. And so there was no reason for them to change their minds. What happened was that Republicans had been down on the economy for a long period of time. And then once Trump got elected, they suddenly felt much better. Um, so th that's, that's, that's a, a, an artifact of partisanship. But I don't think it's, it's – it's not the case that when Democrats are in power, trust in government has gone down, period. I, I don't um, – it, it, it's, there's something more complicated going on there. Um, okay, with, with respect to Hilda's question, so the first on, on the, the sort of majority, you know, what happens when America no longer becomes a, a majority white country. First of all, this is going to sound weird. I'm going to question your premise. I know the demographic trends, but the demographic trends are driven extremely heavily by Hispanics. And this is going to be a fascinating question of the identity of Hispanics – 
of second generation and third generation Hispanics, which is I can easily conceive of a scenario where third generation Hispanics don't think of themselves as Hispanic. They think of themselves as white. Um, and indeed, the very category of white belies the fact that if we were talking about this 100 years ago, we'd be talking about all the dirty Irish and Jews and, and you know, Eastern Europeans that are coming into the United States and, you know, ruining the, the master race in that level, which I'm not, let's be, be, let's be clear, <laughs> don't endorse any of that, but I'm, but I'm saying you would have had that kind of debate happen then. Um, so in some ways, the categories are almost defined in, in some ways by the other. Um, and the question is, to be blunt, do you still see darker skinned Americans as the other in 2045? And I, I want to say no, but I'm, I'm, this is one area where I've grown more and more depressed over time. Um, one, of the, one of the best books that I've read over the last couple of weeks has been um, How Democracies Die by uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt. I don't know if that's gotten here yet. Um, but one of the, the, one of the things I will give them credit for is they point out very plainly that part of the reason there were higher levels of trust in the country in previous eras was that they didn't poll black people. And because African Americans did not have any political voice. And so in the 1950s, you could talk about there being a sort of, you know, much more constrained uh, degree of political difference because, you know, you were only talking about white people. Um, and so as you start widening that, that aperture, it's not surprising that you have, you know, much higher degrees of distrust. And there was a second part of your, oh, the, the, whether the GOP is particularly responsible for this. Um, I mean, obviously the GOP has campaigned more heavily on distrust of government, but I, to be fair, there have been periods where Demo when, when a Republican is in charge, Democrats start distrusting government too. George W. Bush being behind the 9-11 attacks, or for that matter, the Trump administration or, or Donald Trump being a puppet of Russian, you know, plutocrats. Um, one of the things I can't stand about this administration is the degree to which it forces a conspiratorial mindset. I can't stand conspiracy theories, period, but I've, I've talked to a lot of experts who, you know, normally study the Middle East, the sort of Gulf shakedoms, and what they keep telling me now is that it, what bothers them is that they have to apply that kind of mindset to explain what's going on in the United States right now. Um, so that's not good. Uh, so, uh, over here. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Ulf Sverdrup. Thank you so much. Uh, I have uh, one uh, just uh, remark and then two, two small uh, questions. The first is, I think that what you describe as a trust crisis in the U.S. is not only a U.S. crisis. Uh, a lot of the things that you say is also related to what's going on in Europe. So, so that's, uh, and I think that uh, you're stressing on, uh, partly on policy failures, but also on identity politics, I think is really important. Now, two questions, a very simple one. Uh, first one, how to restore trust? How to restore trust in foreign policy, in economic policy, how to overcome political polarization, and how to address the identity challenge? Uh, it's not the easy one, but it will be interesting. Uh, so if it is worth preserving, how to restore it? And, that's, and, that's the, and then the, the second comment relates to uh, this trust in elites and trust in knowledge. Because currently there's a big discussion in the US about misinformation and fake news. And uh, it basically a lot of that discussion is based on the premise that somebody else is somehow misinforming. Uh, otherwise, we would be in uh, we'd be, be in harmony, and we'd, we'd be my, make enlightened decisions. Uh, so, and uh, and then there's this academic literature on motivated beliefs, basically saying that people tend to believe what they believe, and they ignore the rest. So, how do you view this misinformation and this discussion into this highly po polarized political uh, space that you described? How do, uh, how does it fit in somehow? Thank you. So these are very easy questions that I can answer in just probably th 40. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, first, I'm going to agree with you and say the polarization is on this side of the pond as well. We have a tweet that uh, almost took down a duly elected government here in the last few days. So that, that's uh, and another quick oh, comment. Wait, I, I'm sorry. This is where I'm uninformed. Did the Justice Minister, minister get in trouble by something he, she tweeted? Oh, it was a Facebook post. Okay, all right, go ahead. So, so, so it's pretty extreme That's here. That's <laughs> and uh, another quick comment on the, the military. I say the 
uh, and being former military uh, in the U.S. and and maybe globally, it's thought of too. It's probably one institution in the U.S. that is still probably without you know here and there highly regarded and trusted. I mean, once the political people send them somewhere, I think the military itself is very trusted to do a job and do it you know apolitical and that sort of thing. Um, I would say the the shock to the system as far as the election was the reason for Trump being there and uh, through a lot of things that you said and because institutions and a lot of things structurally in the country have just deteriorated to a lot of people's perceptions and uh, you know we'll see over the next couple of years how Trump does in straightening that out but uh, uh, as somewhat the uh, I heard a comment and I want you to comment on this comment uh, the other day where uh, a politician who um, was saying a lot of very interesting things. He said, one issue of misunderstanding that a lot of people are having with, with Trump and the way he's doing things is, they said, Trump is not a diplomat, not a politician. He deals with things on a businessman kind of level. And he's using his policy tweets and his rhetoric to start debates on things and to push the bar on these debates to try to accomplish you know, his, his, his agenda. And this is just his sort of way of doing things, disruptive or not. The question is, if these things are achieving results, do you think that's still gonna be a bad or a good thing? Or um, still he will just be perceived as disruptive uh, in the long term, even if his policy gets enacted? Okay, uh, I'll answer them in reverse order. So uh, Trump is a, so first on Trump, Trump is a businessman, but let's be clear, he's a particular kind of businessman. Trump is a real estate guy. So not even businessmen normally do business the way Trump does it. Um, and so in, in that sense, I, I want to stress that to, to argue that this, certainly a Trump person would make that case, but I think he's a particularly unique kind of of businessman, someone who thinks that the way that you get ahead in bargaining is to take an extreme position with the idea that, you know, if it forces others to make, you know, to accommodate you, then if you only get like half of what you originally asked for, then the incentive is to always ask for the most extreme, and that way you get what you want. Um, how to put this? That's a bargaining 101 sort of approach to the world, and the problem is, is that world politics is more like bargaining a 301. And bargaining 301 says if you start with an extreme negotiating position, you are equally likely to piss off so many of your bargaining partners that they will conclude that you're not serious, you're not, you're not actually bargaining in good faith, and therefore there is no point in having serious negotiations. Um, and so I think to some extent Trump has done this whether it's a question of the tariffs or whether it's a question of renegotiating NAFTA or what have you. Now, you're asking if he gets significant concessions, will that cause a rethink? I think the answer would be yes. If he does get significant concessions, I think it would cause a lot of people to think, oh, well, maybe he actually knows something. Maybe he really, you know, as an instinctive bargainer, is getting what he wants. To put it generously, he hasn't gotten anything yet. Um, I haven't seen any evidence that, that, you know, he's gotten any of these kind of fabulous deals. You know, you see the, the Saudi Arabia, you know, trip. I mean, he got a great orb out of that. Don't get me wrong. And, and we all got great pictures of that orb. But for all the announcement of like all these, these actual deals that were made, if you actually look under the hood, there was no actual new money committed by Saudi Arabia in any of these kinds of arrangements. Similarly, you know, he apparently had this great summit in Mar-a-Lago with Xi Jinping. I haven't seen any concessions whatsoever from the Chinese after that summit. Um, I don't think the Europeans are going to make any concessions when it comes to steel. Um, I don't think either Canada or Mexico are going to make any concessions when it comes to NAFTA. So I'm not convinced that we're going to get, you know, the, the question becomes, what is the deliverable? And I don't think he's delivered anything on that point. Um, on the... Um, so on the on the question of elites and, and trust and how to restore that, um, the 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 thirty second answer. So the quick answer is oh sorry wait I did want to say one last thing on this point I'm sorry on the first point which is on 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 Trump winning as sort of representing a rebuke of elites in some ways this gets to your point I do think there is a danger of over interpreting Trump's victory um, as sort of this general rebuke of all elites for for a few reasons first again I hate to you know, beat a dead horse on this. Trump got three million fewer voters than than Hillary Clinton did. So the idea that this was some popular groundswell in favor of Donald Trump is crap. It's just wrong. The second thing is that, and again, I can't stress this enough, 
There has been one time since 1945 that a political party has won the presidency three times in a row. And that was, you know, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. You know, at the end of the 1990s, Bill Clinton oversaw what would look like a really robust and great economy, and Al Gore loses that election in 2000. It is not shocking that a Republican won in 2016. Um, what's shocking is that Donald Trump became the Republican nominee. And you can argue that Donald Trump became the Republican nominee in part because of this sort of populism, but also because he was running against 14 other Republicans, and with a diverse field, if you got you know, a loyal one-third who were going to vote for you no matter what, you could run the table. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I think there's a tendency to overinterpret what Trump's victory meant. That said, how do we restore trust? One way is weirdly Trump being president. As I said, we now get to see what the counterfactual looks like. Um, very often, you know, elites have, have often said, if we go down this wrong policy choice, bad things will happen. And so, you know, but the problem is if you avert the counterfactual, you don't know if that's actually true. Well, we now have a genuine populist, you know, uh, nationalist in the White House. So to some extent, the degree to which we'll actually see what we get in terms of the, of the economy and in terms of, of foreign policy will be a way in which you can realize, OK, maybe we don't trust the old elites, but we know we don't like this. So maybe we'll have to go back to that. Um, but that said, how do you, you know, build trust in elites and knowledge? <sighs> um, that qualifies, and I'm going to give a slightly glib answer here, that qualifies under what I call a yacht question, which is to say if I had the answer to that question, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be on my yacht somewhere um, because I would have made billions of dollars uh, uh, from it. Um, that, that said, I do think there are two things that can you know, potentially contribute steps forward. The first is transparency. Um, which is not something we normally talk about, but it, transparency in the sense of the acknowledgement by elites that mistakes have been made. Um, that, that one of the things that you occasionally need to do is to traffic some candor in terms of saying we screwed up in the past and therefore, you know, and, and furthermore, we've been somewhat humbled by those mistakes. Um, one, of the th one of the concerns, the legitimate concerns that I do have about Trump is that Trump hasn't just made liberal internationalism great again. He's also made elites like me arrogant again. Um, because you look at his administration and you can think, yeah, I can do better than that, you know, despite all of the, the various, you know, policy miscues that have happened in the past. So I, I do think that while, let's say, Democrats are out in the wilderness or while even sort of Main Street Republicans are out in the wilderness, some, some introspection would be a good thing and some acknowledgement going forward. The second thing we clearly need to get a grip on, although here this is, again, more of a symptom than a cause, is the question of social media and what role it's played in all this. Now, I honestly think that what social media has done is make visible what had always been invisible. You know, the idea that conspiracy theories are unique to the 21st century is absurd. You know, it, this has always existed in the past. What is different is that we can now all observe it in a way that we couldn't before. Um, and so partly I think Elites need to get used to the fact that in some ways it's not that the distrust, the distrust has gone up, but in some ways the factors that play into that are not new. They've always been there. We just didn't really pay attention to it before. So the idea that we're going to suddenly have this massive shift back in trust, I don't think that's possible. But really we don't need that. What we need is a moderate shift towards more trust. And that's fine. You know, that actually would, would in and of itself make a large difference. And as I said before, there is such a thing as healthy distrust or healthy skepticism. I don't think that, that the conclusion to draw from all this is, oh, we were wrong. We should you know, totally trust what, what elites say, because we don't know everything. Um, and we're arrogant enough sometimes to think we do. Let's just face it, if you're in this room, you're an elite. So in the back there, and then the, uh, in the back over there. Uh, Daniel, my name is Lou Cotney. I'm over here in Norway for two little Norwegian Americans. Um, and I'd like to place my question as a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, American male, not necessarily supreme. Um, in significant part, we Americans elected Trump to um, stop the neoconservatives, kick them out of power, uh, get out of the Mideast, uh, get out of this dangerous nuclear confrontation with Russia. Um, Trump appointed Mike Flynn, uh, Tillerson, he had Steve O'Bannon. He had that portrait of Andy by God Jackson above his desk. Now, um, you support Tillerson being kicked out of power. Um, 
but and you've supported Mike Pompeo saying he could actually moderate Trump. But Senator Rand Paul says Mike Pompeo is pro-war. And so I'm concerned about that. I've got another question about uh, distrust of intellectuals like Bernard Ari Levy, who you uh, appear to defend, but I'll save that for later. Um, so um, is Mike Pompeo going to lead us to help lead us to World War III? Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jan Breivel. First of all, thank you for an excellent uh, discussion. Um, early on, you uh, brought up that um, a lot of uh, people, a lot of very safe uh, industrial jobs with a high degree of unionization and relatively high status and wages have simply disappeared, that they're no longer there and that they can't possibly be there. Uh, and uh, a lot of those people would have moved into uh, sort of retail jobs, so such like. But uh, uh, and I'm not sure to the extent to which it is true. But you keep seeing headlines about uh, retail uh, more or less disappearing and dying, and also becoming automatized. Uh, and I would uh, like to hear if you have some uh, comments on what the consequences of uh, that are, and uh, what uh, potentially can be a political solution to overcoming that uh, problem. Thank you. Uh, so again, I'll do the reverse order uh, thing. Uh, so your question is a really good one. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, there, there you know, there's, there's uh, a new phenomenon in the United States about retail deserts um, and, you know, sort of abandoned malls. Uh, and really, in some ways, what, what this is de coping with is that for the longest time, there had been, you know, there's always been a protectionist element within the United States because trade was thought of as a policy choice, um, you know. And if you opened up to trade, it would create new winners and losers. It would redistribute things. And while there is certainly a, a good economics argument for that, the, you know, that on the whole there will be a net gain, you can understand why there were there was political resistance to that. In some ways, what we're beginning to see now is this question of what is what should be government policies towards innovation. Um, because that's what you're talking about. And, you know, this goes back to this Schumpeter concept of creative destruction. The notion of, of in innovation is that it always creates creative destruction. It destroys, you know, certain sectors as well as creating many. Now, one of the ways in which America has, I would argue, been exceptional in the past is that Americans are far more enthusiastic about technological innovation, I think, than most other countries, even most developed countries. Um, and the general norm in the United States has been, yes, even if you you know, have a technological innovation that destroys some old sectors, it doesn't matter because you create all these new ones as a result. So it's okay if, for example, upstate New York is devastated because Kodak and Polaroid go out of business because you've created this whole new digital photography thing and, and the consumer benefits are obvious. I think it's going to be very interesting going forward whether things like automation of, let's say, long-haul trucking or, you know, which is, by the way, the largest source of blue-collar jobs in the United States. Um, or, as you say, retail jobs. I don't have a great answer to this. Um, I, I honestly don't. Um, the, the, w the only thing I will say is that, in some ways, again, this gets bound up in identity questions because it's this notion that what made the United States great was we were a manufacturing powerhouse, that we made things. Um, and the truth is, that was never completely true, um, but it's really not true now because America's you know, comparative advantage is actually in services. Um, we're really good at that. We're also really good at consuming, but that's a whole separate conversation. Um, and the, in some ways, and this goes back in some, in some ways to the, the last question, I think one of the ways that you can actually change the debate in the United States is if weirdly you start valorizing services more. In other words, you don't just lionize the factory worker, you lionize the nurse or the teacher or the other sort of service professional that actually, you know, that, that if you add dignity to those kinds of jobs, and those jobs do have a fair amount of dignity already, I would say, but, you know, if you actually add dignity to those things, that actually does change the conversation a little bit. But that's a hard thing to do, and it takes time. On Mike Pompeo, um, so let me be clear what I was trying to say about that. I, Rex Tillerson had, as I said, foreign policy instincts that I was probably more simpatico with. I didn't think the United States should pull out of Paris. Um, I don't think we should pull out of the Iranian nuclear deal. I don't think we should necessarily trigger a war in North Korea. 
I'm pretty sure Rex Tillerson believed in all of those things, but it didn't matter because Rex Tillerson was the least competent Secretary of State in history. It doesn't matter if you believe those things if no one's listening to you. Um, and again, what I was genuinely impressed by was the fact that Tillerson managed to alienate every major power center in the United States that you would care about if you're a Secretary of State. The only person who was on his side by the end of it was the Secretary of Defense, which is not an insignificant thing, but the President didn't trust him, the building didn't trust him, Congress didn't trust him. And if that's your situation, it doesn't matter what you believe because no one's going to listen to you anyway. Pompeo, on the other hand, is undeniably more hawkish, and I am concerned to some extent about whether or not that means the United States will pursue a more hawkish course of action. But that said, Trump trusts him in a way that he doesn't trust Tillerson, or never trusted Tillerson, which means that if Trump were to you know, propose something like, let's say, I don't know, a bloody nose strike on North Korea, that someone even as hawkish as Mike Pompeo might stop for a moment and think, well, I'm not sure I like where that's going to go. And if someone like Pompeo says, I don't think that's the right course of action, Trump will listen to him in a way that he would not have listened to Tillerson. So uh, let me put it this way. I don't know what's going to happen if Pompeo gets confirmed to Secretary of State. For that matter, I don't know if Pompeo is going to get confirmed to Secretary of State because, among other things, as you point out, Rand Paul opposes him, and him plus 49 Democrats equals a real serious uh, problem. Now, it might not go that way. That said... There are moments where a hawk, if they're a responsible hawk, can actually stop even worse impulses. And at this point, all I'm concerned about with the Trump administration is preventing the worst case scenario. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any more questions. So, oh, here's one. Halvaleira from, from Nupi here. Thanks for coming. Uh, one question we haven't really talked that much about is international trust. And the question is really goes back to the United States, though. Um, to what extent do you believe the elites in America have realized that, for at least for Europeans and for many others as well, um, Donald Trump is not a bug, he's a feature. Over the last five elections, three times you elected, two times you elected George Bush Jr., and one time you elected Trump. And so do, do you, to what extent have American foreign policy elites, or elites more generally, acknowledged that to outsiders, I mean, the U.S. is not just not trustworthy. I mean, I mean, the parties tend to change, and the, if the Republican Party tends to nominate people like this, you, you, you move from a position where the United States could lead and have a sort of, well, I don't like the word soft power, but you had sort of transactional costs were low because you were trusted. I mean, a lot of people just by gut reaction trust in the United States. If you move to a situation where everything is interest-based from the other side as well, from the European side as well, the costs for America of doing foreign policy are going to be sort of rising all the time. So do people realize this? Or is this just sort of, do, do people actually believe that if you elect someone else, things are going to be just hunky-dory and fine? Oh. Last question. <coughs> The million dollar question, my name is Bente Knagenian. Will Trump have the guts to fire Robert Mueller? <laughs> um, okay, so I'll answer the second question first, which, um, first of all, saying have the guts is the wrong way to frame it, um, because it would be, an, it would be a, an episode of rank stupidity if you did that. Um, I think if Trump has any degree of introspection, I don't know if he has any, he would acknowledge that his biggest mistake in his first year of office was firing James Comey as FBI director because that move triggered the appointment of the special counsel, which has then led to where we are now. Um, if he fires Mueller, you know, we have press, it partly depends on how much longer this is going to go on. When does he do it? But the fact is, is that, you know, the Mueller investigation has actually been as special prosecutors or special counsels go, it's been a remarkably productive one. He's been, it's worth remembering, he's been in office less than a year. He's already, what, indicted five, I mean, he already has indicted something like 20 people. He's gotten plea deals for a couple of them. There's going to be a trial of Paul Manafort coming in the fall. Um, he's made a fair amount of progress. So, and, and indeed, if you take a look at polling, most Americans do trust the Mueller probe more than they trust the Trump administration. So if he does, it's worth remembering that when Richard Nixon tried this um, during what was called the Saturday Night Massacre, when he ordered um, his attorney general to fire Archibald Cox, who at that point was the special prosecutor, Cox refused, he, and then Nixon fired him. 
His deputy refused. His deputy got fired as well. And then finally, the Solicitor General fired Cox. That was called the Saturday Night Massacre in the United States. And in some ways, it was the beginning of the end for Nixon, because it indicated the degree to which he was willing to abuse his power. I suspect it would play out that way. In other words, he would ask Rod Rosenstein to fire Mueller. My guess is Rosenstein would refuse, at which point he would have to fire Rosenstein and then find a subordinate who would do it. And it would be as problematic because, it, you know, it's been the one tripwire for congressional Republicans. I mean, and you saw that over the weekend where you even had people like Marco Rubio actually pretend like they have a spine or something. Um, so, you know, that was so I, I don't I actually don't think in the end he's going to do it. And the other reason, by the way, is that he's clear he's wanted to do it for quite some time. And it's been the one area where his own staff has said no. We know that Don McGahn has refused twice to, you know, intercede to try to fire Mueller. I don't think I think this is one of the areas where his staff would actually refuse to, to follow his orders on that. Um, back to the question on on uh, on the United States more generally. Um, so let me let me act as this proud American and, and, and give a, a response, which is, on the one hand, look, I'm not going to deny what you're saying. We're like the worst relationship Europe has ever been in, right? We're like the most volatile, significant other you must have ever been involved with. Sometimes we're great. Sometimes we're abused. It's, it's, it's a real problem. But that said, the, the same country that voted Donald Trump and George W. Bush president also was the first OECD country to vote an ethnic minority to be its president in the form of Barack Obama. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a mixed bag that way. Um, and th that said, I think in some ways it, it goes back to this question of elections having consequences. So for example, American or European attitudes towards the United States, they weren't thrilled with George W. Bush getting elected. It was 2004 that was really the problem. It wasn't that we elected George W. Bush the first time, because that was a really close election. And again, George W. Bush lost the popular vote. It was that we reelected him. So I think the answer to your question is what happens in 2020? If Donald Trump gets reelected, then, yeah, things are going to get really bad. Um, and the, real the, the, the other disturbing thing is that uh, it, American attitudes about this. I went to a, so a conference on soft power where we debated this. And, and part of the problem is, is that the American attitudes on this is, well, yes, we've been in moments like this before. In fact, we were in this moment in 2008 where if you looked at all like the sort of public opinion polling and so on and so forth, American soft power had been eviscerated. And what did we do? We elected Barack Obama, and we all it all recovered. You know, if you looked at the polling data, if you looked at any of it, things looked much better. And so I think the belief that a lot of America, you know, even um, American elites have is, well, we can recover. And this is where I start to get a little worried, because Barack Obama was a unique case. You know, he was different in a variety of ways. He was genuinely charismatic. He was a minority, and so as a result, that the election, because of who Barack Obama was and because of how he acted, we wound up recovering in a way that I'm not sure if we elect, let's say, a Joe Biden or you know, a sort of garden variety Democrat, you'll have the same effect. Uh, but I think the real issue here is not – things don't look good now. The question becomes 2020. If Donald Trump gets reelected, then that, I'm actually legitimately worried about there being a permanent divorce. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for a very interesting uh, discussion and your analysis of uh, U.S. domestic politics and U.S. foreign policy. I want to uh, say again, uh, the just mention, uh, Professor Yin Hang Shi uh, of Renmin University is coming May 3rd to discuss similar issues with uh, our colleague Hans Jürgen Gosemir and Fyodor Lukianov, who is the chairman of the Council for Foreign and Defense Policy will talk with uh, Julie Willemsen on June 14th about the similar thing. Um, but for now, thank you so much for coming, uh, Dan, and thank you all for, for coming. Thank you.